Hi there, and welcome to Orca Media. I'm here today with Shap Smith, who is the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and he is running for Lieutenant Governor of the state of Vermont in the August 9th primary. Shap, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate great, your time. It's great to be here, Chris. Thanks. Great. Yeah. So tell our viewers a little about how you got started in Vermont politics. Yeah. Well, I mean, I grew up in Vermont. I grew up in, uh, in the Umoyo County area. My uh, mom was in uh, Elmore and my dad was in uh, Wolcott. And <clears throat> my mom and my stepdad were very involved in uh, town politics. My stepdad was the town clerk in Elmore. My mom was the tax collector and the constable. Um, don't so mess with Shap's mom. You don't, uh, yeah, you don't mess. <laughs> Thankfully, she has the same, uh, doesn't have the same la last name. So when I ran the first time, people didn't know that I was uh, the uh, son of the tax collector. Um, and, and so in two, in, I moved back to Lamoille County in 1999 when my wife and I uh, uh, decided that we wanted to start a family. And uh, in 2002, there were open seats. And so I had this history of family involvement, and I decided to throw my hat in the ring. And um, I just knocked on a ton of doors and ended up uh, winning by 42 votes the first time that I, I ran. Wow. Yeah. And so tell <clears throat> us a little about your family. Yeah. So you talked a little about your mom and dad, yeah. but uh, tell us about uh, your, your wife and well, your kids. And yeah, I mean, so uh, my wife it grew up in uh, both Montpelier and then uh, up in Lamoille County. And uh, she graduated from Stowe High School. I graduated from PA uh, in Morseville. And then we uh, both went our separate ways. We didn't meet until after, but I ended up going to UVM and she did. Um, and then when we moved back, we moved back because my wife is a family practice doctor. Um, she had finished her residency and she works for a federally qualified health clinic in Lamoille County at their uh, Stowe office. And so we live in Morseville. We have two young kids, 14 and 11. My son, Eli, who's 14, is going to high school this year with uh, all the attendant worries that that brings. Congratulations <coughs> or condolences. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, my daughter is going into sixth grade. So we're, we're really lucky. We've, uh, you know, we have a, a lot of family around. Uh, my siblings live in, in the area, uh, cousins. I mean, it's just, it's a really, really neat uh, to be able to spend so much time with family. Mm. Yeah. So. You spent, a uh, reminder of yours, how many years in the House of Representatives now? Yeah, I have been in the House for 14 years. Uh, I was elected in 2002, served six years, uh, two years on the Fish, Wildlife, and Water Resources Committee, and then four on the Ways and Means Committee. And then in 2008, I decided that I would run for Speaker. And I was elected in 2009 and have been Speaker of the House for the last eight years. Yeah. So what's, what's the difference between being a rank and file <laughs> House member working on a committee uh, with your peers yeah. and being Speaker of the House. I mean, it's a different dynamic, yeah. right? So, so yeah. tell me more about how that transition works and, and sort of what's the difference between just being a voting member representing a community and then perhaps sort of almost representing not only a caucus but also being the leader of that body, state uh, government. It, it, it is a uh, staggering difference. As a member of the body, an individual member of the body who sits on the committee, um, you're more focused on just what that committee is doing uh, and you are more focused uh, probably as an individual representative for your district. When you step into the speaker's role, you are really representing the body as a whole, and uh, to a large degree, the interests of the people of the state of Vermont as a whole. You are technically the highest ranking official of your party within the body, uh, but your role really is to try to knit the members of the body together uh, to move things forward. And so uh, you, sp I sp <clears throat> you have to be an expert in the, all of the areas that uh, the House is dealing with. With the 14 committees, you're constantly being briefed on what's going on in those committees, and you have to sort of sort through the issues and figure out how to move them forward. So uh, <clears throat> it's really about figuring out how to work with people, how to prioritize, prioritize issues, how to uh, work with the governor, work with the Senate. It's, uh, it's been a phenomenal, phenomenal job. I, I've loved every minute of Well, 
I've loved the job. <laughs> <laughs> and is that what attracted you to the lieutenant governor's race? Yeah, I. so the lieutenant governor is in some ways different than the speaker in that uh, you are not solely responsible for appointing committees uh, and uh, you're, you're less of the leader of the body because the majority leader or president pro tem tends to be uh, the person who's driving things. But what I like about the lieutenant governor's position is I think that it gives you an opportunity to pull people together on issues of real importance for the state, highlight them and try to move those issues forward. You know, issues like childhood poverty, issues like health care, downtown redevelopment. I mean, all of the things that I think we really need to uh, address um, as, you know, as a state. Well, so it's an interesting <clears throat> tension because on the one hand, you're trying to forge consensus on some of these issues. On the other hand, you have something of a bully pulpit yeah. uh, as lieutenant governor, a platform, if you will, to talk to ordinary Vermonters and hear their concerns. Uh, but you also have to work with the members within uh, the Senate body. <clears throat> it's true. I mean, you really do need to... Um, figure out a way to deal with individual senators and make them feel like uh, you're listening to them. And <clears throat> I think one of the things that I've really uh, developed, and I think I had it before I became speaker, is figuring out how to actively listen to people and understand um, where places are that they can reach some common ground. Um, and I think many of the senators saw that <clears throat> in me as the Speaker of the House. And, you know, in March and April, uh, many of them came to me and asked me if I would think about running for um, the lieutenant governor spot as somebody who they had seen had the ability to forge consensus among the members of the body. So <clears throat> talk to me a little bit about your tenure as speaker. What are some of the what are, what are some of the signature pieces of legislation or the accomplishments that you felt you were able to deliver on behalf of Vermonters during your time yeah. as speaker? Yeah. I mean, there, there are a lot. Over eight years, we have done just a tremendous amount of work. In my first year as speaker, I think we changed the tide in the national debate on uh, marriage equality. Many people forget that in 2008, when um, California overwhelmingly elected uh, President Obama, uh, they also passed a, uh, a, a law saying um, you could not uh, have e equal uh, civil marriage rights. This was a ballot initiative. It was a ballot initiative. Um, and, and there were other states that were doing the same thing. We were moving in the wrong direction. And Vermont had been a leader in 2000 on civil unions. And in 2009, we stepped up to the plate and said, we're going to be a leader again. And without a court order, we're going to move forward with, uh, with marriage equality legislation. And uh, I was a new speaker uh, and in the national spotlight. And we moved forward. And we knew that we had the votes to pass marriage equality. And then all of a sudden, uh, Governor Douglas announces that he's going to veto it. Now, up until that time, there had been six successful veto overrides in the history of the state of Vermont. And so it just shows how difficult it is to do. Well, I led the effort in the House, along with my colleagues like Floyd Neese and Lucy LaRiche, who are in the part of the leadership team, but also working with uh, Minority Leader Patty Comline uh, and members of the Progressive Party and Independents to pull together a coalition of 100 votes so that we could override that vote and uh, that veto. And uh, that still stands out as one of the proudest moments of my life when I read that vote and realized that we were making an impact on everyday Vermonters' lives and showing the way. And I believe that that did lead to um, 2015 when the US Supreme Court said marriage equality is the law of the land. So. Uh, that's one thing in particular. There are other issues that uh, we, we should talk about. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for that personally. Yeah. Um, as you know, my father was a gay man. My mother is a lesbian. Mm -hmm. And she uh, finally, just in the last two or three years, was able to marry her spouse yep. of 30 plus years in the state of Maine. Yep. And it was because Vermont knocked over the first domino, mm -hmm. both on civil unions and ultimately on marriage equality, that that was able to happen. And now they have that security, the legal security, 
of a recognized union so that they can have transfer of property. They have security in terms of their rights around health care. Mm -hmm. um, all of her benefits when she was working as an employee that extended to her mm -hmm. spouse. All of that, which is so important, which, you know, frankly, the heterosexual community took for granted as a right of marriage, is now extended um, to the LGBT community. Yeah. And thank you. If, well, you, you're welcome. And, and, you know, I had friends and family who were directly impacted by the legislation. And um, it really was a, a, a no brainer. And with regard to Maine, I remember in 2009 when I was uh, first speaker, I went to a training program for uh, speakers and I ran into then speaker uh, Hannah Pingree and we talked about it. We were talking about the, the fact that we were going to pass marriage equality and we were talking with a Democratic colleague uh, from one of the southern states about marriage equality and he, he personally supported it but he just couldn't understand how um, any state could actually move forward with it and, um, and his state now has it. <laughs> <laughs> so true, so true. Yeah. So what are some of the other accomplishments from your time in the House? And let's talk about your campaign and what yeah. your vision is for the future yeah. and your role as lieutenant governor. But one or two other quick things that people might not know about you yeah. that you feel like you, you spent time and uh, galvanized the House yeah. around. So uh, one of them passed just this year, and that's paid sick leave. I mean, a lot of people didn't uh, realize that 60,000 Vermonters were without paid sick leave. 60,000 working Vermonters had to make decisions about whether they were going to stay home with their sick kid or whether they were going to leave that kid home and go uh, make money. And uh, the majority minimum wage workers right. and women. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, three or four years ago, I was out there as the only leader of uh, the legislative bodies who was saying, we have to move this issue forward. This is an issue that's important to working Vermonters. Um, and I remember being at a Vermont Chamber of Commerce lunch and saying, I supported the legislation and I believe that we should do it. And the cricket. Did you get a standing ovation? I did not get a standing ovation. <laughs> and uh, uh, my colleagues who said, no, we can't do it, uh, were warmly received. So uh, we put together a strategy working with the advocates, working with uh, my fellow legislators, to make sure that that cut caught, got across the line. And frankly, uh, that's one of uh, my proudest moments as well because it made a real difference in lives of working Vermonters. And uh, we wouldn't have gotten that across the line if uh, that bill hadn't had strong leadership support uh, from me and people like Kellen Head and people like Sarah Copeland Hanses, who was the majority leader and who, who had a small business of her own, helped forge a compromise on that. So uh, that, to me, uh, is a signal that the legislature gets it, gets the struggles that a lot of working Vermonters are having, and is willing to do things to make their lives better. Well, I want to remind uh, viewers of one other that might seem like a footnote, but critically important. This was at the height of the recession. Yeah. Uh, and the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund was really running in the red because so many people were out of work and looking for work uh, because layoffs were just taking place all over the state. <clears throat> and so at a time when people needed those benefits the most and were actually eligible for the, those benefits, there was a discussion taking place in the state. I believe this was under, uh, it was under Jim Douglas's yep. administration. But there was a lot of talk about either cutting those benefits right. or maybe even taxing workers. I know there's at least one proposal to tax workers yep. to have them pay for their unemployment benefits. Totally the wrong direction right. and yeah. at a time when people could least afford to incur that kind of expense. So uh, I know that you I and fought then, hard against and that. And then yeah. President Pro Tem uh, Shumlin really fought back against that and you were able to not only design a plan to fix the unemployment fund but to make sure the benefits weren't cut. And that was critically important at that time and I think that Vermonters should know that because I think when it comes to working Vermonters you know, that's a place where you've had several examples like paid sick days, yeah. but the unemployment fight was a big one at the time. Well, it's not only that. I mean, and, and that was critically important. I, I remember when I was growing up, there were times where uh, my folks uh, didn't have a job and unemployment uh, insurance was critically important to them. Uh, and I brought that to that discussion. And it was very frustrating for me to hear people talk about cutting those benefits 
without really having any understanding of what that might mean to a working family. It was the same thing when the idea of cutting the earned income tax credit was proposed. We asked people to go out and work and try to make a living. We have a program called the Earned Income Tax Credit that tries to make it worth their while to do it. What the heck are we thinking about cutting something like that and making it less advantageous for particularly single moms to go out into the workforce and try to uh, get ahead? It just was nuts. And when that was proposed, I said, absolutely not. We're not going to do that. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. It's really, it seems like you're, you're trying to sort of create conditions so that you can make work pay right. for Vermonters. And like you said, make it worth their while. Yeah. So the other one, again, uh, just this year, you were instrumental in passage of a bill that would allow Vermonters to get back on the road safely, legally, and affordably. Yeah. Uh, I remember... Uh, T.J. Donovan, who's running for attorney general, the state's attorney up in Chittenden County, and he launched this sort of pilot program to try to um, give people a fine that they could afford if they'd been locked out of a system that didn't recognize their inability to pay their traffic tickets. This yep. is just speeding tickets, not DUIs or anything like that. Yep. And when he launched that program, nobody really knew what was going to happen. And I remember going up to Burlington that morning to the courthouse, and the line was a mile long around the whole city block. Some people had showed up overnight. Mm -hmm. There was one guy that had come from West Virginia because the transportation systems now all talk to each other. So if you're locked out of your license in Vermont, you're not gonna be able to get your license in West Virginia until you make good on these tickets. Right. So it really shows how it goes to people's ability to earn a living, yep. to be able to drive and take care of their kids, get them to childcare or to school or what have you. And in a rural state, if you don't have a license, you're you're ability to participate in your community is very limited. So I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. You know, I, I remember when uh, TJ moved that forward, uh, and I think, you think you're right, none of us sort of had any understanding about how successful it would be. Uh, but when it came to fruition, and we saw what a difference it made in people's lives, and gave them, yet again, opportunities to get their license back, make sure they could go to work, um, I think we realized, hey, w this is a no-brainer. Uh, it w turned out that it wasn't as easy as a no-brainer. I mean, it took a little while to go forward, but you know, Maxine Grad, who's the chair of the Judiciary Committee in the House, and Willem Jewett, the vice chair, uh, worked really, really hard to make sure, and with you and others, to make sure that that got across the line. And it's going to make a difference yet again in people's lives. Here's the thing. Uh, we want to make sure that people have opportunities to make a better life for themselves. You know, we rightly uh, want people to work hard and we want people uh, to do the right thing, but we've got to make sure that we've given them the conditions to do that. And it's not only making sure that they can get to work or that uh, they have good childcare. Uh, but it's also making sure that they get paid a livable wage. So those are, you know, that's what we've been fighting for in the House. So what do you want to fight for as lieutenant governor? <laughs> yeah. So there are three things that I'm really focused on. Uh, you know, one is childhood poverty. Anybody who's got kids in the schools uh, sees the impact of childhood poverty and the lack of early childhood education on young Vermonters. And I really worry about losing a generation of Vermonters. And I grew up in Lamoille County, and you know things weren't always easy for people, but it does seem like things are worse, particularly for people who are at the lower end of the um, socioeconomic ladder. So, you know, we know that early education makes a huge difference. And Let's Grow Kids, an organization here in Vermont, is working with business community and others to come up with some ideas around how we can create even better, affordable, and quality childcare for kids as soon, you know, for zero, basically zero to three. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that would make a huge difference in childhood poverty. And it's gotta be in, done in conjunction with raising the minimum wage. Uh, we need to look at family leave, but um, really giving kids the opportunities to grow their brain right out of the, you know, 
right out of the box. Mm -hmm. So early so, childhood. Yep. Are you are you supporting the a phase in of the fifteen dollar minimum wage? Yeah, I am. Okay. I think that it makes sense. I do think that you know, like we have phased in the uh, increase to ten ten, mm -hmm. uh, I think that we can phase it in to fifteen dollars, uh, and I think that it's going to make sense. You are lifting all boats by doing that, um, and so. You know, I'll work with the next Senate and the next House, next uh, governor, to make sure that that happens. Um, uh, so minimum wage, early childhood, yeah. what's another uh, key so, issue? So, uh, you know, I think one of the keys to our economic vitality is uh, vital regional centers, investments in our downtown. Uh, you look at uh, a community like Barrie that has put money into its downtown, and they were struggling, and, and I think that they're making progress to uh, increase the economic vitality there. Winooski, uh, you go down to Brattleboro. We need as a, st a state to make sure that we have those vital downtowns because they're attractive to young people and old people alike. People want to live in communities where they can work, live, and play. And uh, that's, I, I think the state needs to focus even more there and in particular work on creating not only affordable housing, but workforce housing in those areas so that people have opportunities to live downtown. Um, the third thing is, uh, and this really comes out of, uh, I've always been committed to healthcare reform. We've had a bunch of bumps in the road, uh, but you know, experience that we had as a family over the last uh, 12 months uh, reinforced how much we need to work on healthcare. My, many people know my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. She had phenomenal care. But um, if you tried to understand what we owed, because we had a high deductible plan, uh, and where we were supposed to pay it, uh, it was impossible. And it turned out that we had thought we were going to owe $2,000, and we ended up owing $6,000 and had to do that out of pocket. Well, for a lot of families, that would be the difference between solvency and bankruptcy. And there are a lot of approaches that we could do to, to deal with that. One of them is primary care, universal primary care. The other idea builds on a successful program that we've had in the state for years called Dr. Dinosaur. Dr. Dinosaur provides uh, health care coverage for many of Vermont's children. Why don't we provide it to all Vermont's kids, 26 and under? And so that actually tracks with the Affordable Care Act, which yep. allowed children to stay on their parents' plan right. until they were 26. So this isn't some sort of crazy new idea that's saying we're going to, uh, you know, extend childhood to some right. degree. It's saying, you know, if you're through college, essentially, yep. or for people who are working their way through college, maybe they'll still be able to get this Dr. Dinosaur program. Yeah, it mirrors uh, part of what the Affordable Care Act does. It builds on a program that we've already had implemented. Uh, it gives us a chance to show Vermonters that we can manage uh, a health care system. And uh, it, it has a couple things that I think are attractive. One, for parents now who have high deductible plans and they're taking their kids to the doctor, you know what, they're having to make decisions about whether their kid's going to get an x-ray or an MRI based on whether they can afford it. Well, we shouldn't put parents in that kind of position. And the other thing is, hey, for kids that are 18 to 26, wouldn't it be a cool recruiting tool to say, you don't have to worry about your health care coverage if you live here in Vermont? And that would be true for college students often have to have health care uh, coverage to actually enroll in college. Mm. So it could be something to retain young people yeah. and, or encourage young people to relocate here. Yeah. And that's why uh, you know, I got the endorsement of Howard Dean. He was very impressed that I had pushed for a study on this. It's gonna, the report's going to come back um, in, uh, sometime in November. Um, and that's why I, I, I think it's a way that we can move past the health care exchange and show people that we can do it right. Tell us something. We have about five minutes before we're going to wrap up. Yep. Give us one thing you've learned or something that stood out as you've campaigned and met Vermonters from all corners of the state. What's the one thing that kind of jumps out at you as you talk to people about your plan, yeah. um, but, but also the, the thing that you're hearing the most? So um, what I hear is that Vermonters are still uh, inventive and resourceful, and there's a lot of really cool stuff that's happening around the state. There are a lot of neat new businesses. Um, 
people coming together to build community. And I just think that the Vermont spirit is alive and well. And we hear a lot of um, Vermont is bad for this or Vermont is bad for that. What uh, I think is heartening is that I still see a lot of people who are optimistic that if they get involved, they can change things. And that, I think, is the Vermont way. There are real challenges. You know, you hear about opiates. Um, I hear about affordable housing in every part of the state, um, and not just for those who are on the lowest end of the political uh, ladder, but you know, middle class folks are really struggling to find housing that's affordable. Uh, give us one little insight into the, the soul of the man, if you will. Give us a, a mentor or inspiring figure from history, either somebody you knew, somebody in your life that's made a difference, um, or somebody you turn to or look to for advice, or yeah. somebody that just sort of motivates you and inspires you. Yeah. Um, you know, I really look, uh, throughout my uh, tenure as speaker, I looked to uh, Mike Obahowski as someone who I would uh, talk to. Uh, I would have lunch, I would have breakfast with him every Friday morning uh, during the session. Um, and the reason that I looked to him is he always reminded me of the fact that you needed to be thinking about the person who uh, was going to work with the lunch, uh, lunch pail uh, and uh, that you just needed to remember the working folks who you were representing. And uh, he, he never forgot that uh, as speaker or as a representative. And uh, he was very, he is a very wise man. And uh, I've always thought of him as a real mentor towards me. Towards, and it's hard to pick one out uh, because, you know, I always, it, Gay Symington was such a, a good mentor to, to me. Uh, Rick Hubie, who's a Republican uh, from Londonderry, who we lost to early, uh, would give me advice sometimes, many times advice I didn't want to take. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, and, and, and I look to historical figures like uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who got us through an incredible transition time uh, when the economy was changing. So uh, there are a lot of people that I look to. Shap Smith, thank you so much for your time today. Good luck thank in you. your campaign. We have a few days left before the August 9, 2016 primary. Shap Smith running for lieutenant governor. And uh, I know you'll be out meeting people in Montpelier and yep. Washington County and across the rest of the state in the remaining days of this campaign. Uh, we wish you luck. Thank you very much. Thanks.